So I, I'm very uh, thankful to be invited. It's really nice, and it's a really nice panel of people that you're inviting across the workshop. Um, sounds like a very interesting event. Um, I was uh, intrigued by the title, Digital Crafting. It's a word that's been around for a long time. Uh, in 2009, uh, we wrote, a, we, we ran a, a network here in Denmark, um, a European network called uh, Digital Crafting. Um, I think it was 2008 or something like that. Um, Camacho Cola wrote their book on digital crafting. And lately, I've heard the term uh, theorized as part of a um, sustainability discourse. So I think it's one of these plastic words that that uh, move around. They, s they slightly changes meaning uh, in time. I'm sure it doesn't mean the same that it did 15 years ago, uh, when maybe it was being coined or when it started to uh, occurring. Um, so what I have prepared is a little uh, presentation of sort of moving through our own thinking and how we're working right now with these ideas. Um, but it was just a little bit of a historic uh, uh, dip down to just uh, wonder where this term, uh, how this term can generate uh, uh, imagination and, and meaning. Um, so uh, first of all, yes, I am Meta. I am uh, the head of the Center for IT and Architecture at CETA at the Copenhagen uh, uh, Royal Academy at the um, uh, schools of architecture, design, and conservation, um, where we, well, remit is to work with uh, digital uh, fabrication, um, uh, new material processes, uh, and advanced uh, uh, modeling <coughs> uh, methodologies, trying to figure out how we can challenge and rethink uh, what a digital practice uh, can be. Uh, and how it affects us uh, both uh, uh, technologically, materially, socially, and culturally. So also the sort of really considering computation as a ground research question, question that, that fundamentally changes the way that we uh, think, uh, design, and uh, build architecture. Um, so a lot of our focus has been on the information model, the idea of what a model can be uh, and uh, how computation challenges the, uh, uh, the traditions of tra uh, representation in architecture. Um, and one of the key thoughts here is really that it is with the moment of um, this direct translation into fabrication that something shifts. So traditionally and also actually uh, architects prescribe, we have a prescriptive practice, draw information, and this information is used by other people, to read by other people uh, to be able to fabricate. And I think one of the fundamental changes with digital fabrication is really that we are able to understand uh, computation as a di direct link to material manipulation. And with that comes a lot of questions about how we actually formalize and understand material behaviors uh, or all the knowledge that lies within the craft traditions uh, into our model. We are often presented with IT as this sort of image of optimization, BIM and other sort of uh, paradigms of uh, advanced modeling, parametric design or something, tries to present computation as a sort of smooth transition from an existing practice into something that is the same, just better or faster or cheaper or uh, more intelligent. And the question is really, um, if that's really what is only at stake, or if there is many much more uh, deep-rooted changes to the way we understand and design uh, 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 with materials in architecture. Um, just a little bit of context also. Uh, CETA is a uh, research center, but we also have an associated master's course called Computation in Architecture, which is a sort of research-led international master's, um, and where we really start asking uh, profound questions to how it, what it is that we're really educating for. So I think that the point of education, maybe it has always been like that, but for sure right now, 
is that the future is changing very, or our understanding of technology is changing very much. We don't uh, have a sort of concise understanding of what practice would be. I think uh, uh, in, in, in 5, 10, 15 years, I think when I was educated, this idea of immediate change and technological transformation was not as present as it is now. We now know that we, we are actually not completely aware of what skills we will need in the future, and that we understand that the architect uh, herself is changing continuously um, from a, a draftsman or designer to now other kinds of roles, maybe machinist or simulationist or other sort of ideas of how um, technology is fusing into our design practice. Um, asking us new questions about how we can think about technology, technology in society, technology and culture, or technology and environment, technology uh, the biosphere, technology and biology. So we're really trying to say, well, how does, uh, how do we probe these uh, frontiers of thinking to allow students and ourselves to develop our own critical uh, practices uh, with uh, with new technology. I think also we now exist in a context where uh, we need to uh, put profound questions to our practice that come from a, a, a beyond a sort of a introscopic or introvert understanding of what it means to represent, what it means to build, but instead that we need to consider also uh, external pressures onto our practice. And it is clear that we are, of course, living in an era of immediate climate uh, change, um, exponential population growth, and continual urbanization. And they, these pressures are changing fundamentally what it is that we're building for. Uh, population growth, we've heard a lot uh, in the last five years that you know, we will be uh, 2.3 billion more people in the next 50 years. Uh, and this puts a new pressure on architecture, creating a new need for architecture. Um, uh, also clearly that this need is not necessarily in the Western countries, but that they are really appearing in Asia and Africa. So they, they ask us to consider new uh, potential futures or new ways of practice in, in, in contexts that are beyond our own, speaking here from a European uh, perspective. We can see also that most of these uh, uh, very large uh, expansions are happening in cities, um, making uh, uh, urbanization one of the uh, uh, 21st century's most transformative trends uh, uh, for both practice and for uh, the way that we live together. Um, so uh, this new need for architecture um, also uh, puts a new pressure on the idea of resource. So architecture is famously uh, uh, intense in its use of materials. In industrialized countries, we use over 40% of all extracted materials are used within the built environment. Or in Europe, it's 30 to 50% of all materials that goes into construction, with 65% of them being aggregates, meaning uh, sand and gravel and um, and uh, uh, 20% being metal. So it just as a huge pressure, it's not so strange, of course, because we all live and work in buildings and we all uh, exist within an urban context or in a, a, a built context. Um, so it is clear that they, we have this uh, fundamental role as architects in constructing our built environment and creating um, uh, or, or developing um, new methods of using resource. And when we can change our practices, we can also have a huge impact on these practices as they mature. We sit in a heritage of industrialization. In Europe and the West, uh, industrialization uh, belongs to the idea of the uh, 19th and 20th century. Um, and after the war, uh, industrialization was a way of lifting us out of the uh, slums through cheap mass-produced stock, um, facilitating a rebuilding of society, um, but also generating a dependency on a certain group of materials. So industrialization, this uh, 
uh, highly dependent on steel and concrete, um, creating uh, a, a new dependency on the geosphere, on the, which are non-renewable materials. So we are extracting materials which we are which are not being regenerated. Um, industrialization also comes with a disregard for waste, the belief that manufacturing is cheap uh, uh, and and plentiful comes with the idea that waste is just a necessary byproduct uh, of efficiency and transformation. And waste appears all around us. It appears in, uh, in uh, ma wasteful manufacture, in fundamentally subtractive uh, uh, fabrication technologies, in over-engineering, the idea of dormant materials that are waiting for the worst case scenario, um, and our inability to re-extract materials uh, on this assembly or end of life. Um, so these are challenges to us. How do we rethink these kinds of practices and how do we uh, um, uh, build, uh, uh, find new ways of building with materials that allows us to uh, consider waste in new ways? Um, it brings with it also this idea of material depletion, the idea that materials would be running out. Uh, we have seen this in the IT uh, or sort of um, uh, technologies for mobile phones, computers, and so on, that they are using um, very particular uh, uh, minerals that are running out uh, slowly. Um, but also in the built environment, we know that uh, uh, the base materials for concrete, sand, and gravel um, are being used, uh, are overused. And we know that over the next 20 years, we will, if we continue to produce in the way that we are doing right now, that we'll simply run out of sand, um, of the particular sand types that are used in concrete. So, said in a sort of slightly light way, and when we are finding ourselves drowning in plastic, we are running out of basic aggregates and minerals. We simply need to think about materials in new ways. But, but it seems a little bit like, oh, the argument is that um, we need to optimize our material resources so that we have enough to build all this architecture. But there are also huge uh, social and cultural um, consequences of this kind of uh, uh, material depletion. Um, Sand is being illegally mined. Uh, it means that uh, local communities are being are are uh, living in devastated areas where um, the uh, erosion of coastlines uh, or riverbeds uh, have direct impact on everyday life and and resource uh, such as fishing. Um, uh, and it also challenges us to really consider. What are the actual costs of resources? So when we live in a globalized economy, we use sand that has traveled uh, to us or energy that's traveled to us um, uh, from afar, and we have very little understanding of the direct consequences of extraction. This is the fracking landscapes of the Dakotas, um, where the environment is under direct ruin um, and it is exactly this idea that we have divorced the uh, environmental costs of uh, resource from uh, the from the the price uh, from from the from the usage that we are uh, implementing them in, and that we don't really understand what the real costs of energy or real costs of resource are when we're using them. Um, so in our context, we often see uh, Industry 4.0, cyber-physical systems, or virtual prototyping as solutions to this idea that we would be able to optimize ourselves out of the problem to create intelligent design systems that would be able to use less materials in smarter ways is given to us as a, as a sort of um, uh, answer. But the question for us, is, is, is it really, is it truly an, a question of optimization? Can we optimize ourselves out of the problem or are there other much more fundamental ways to, to think about how to act in this world? Um, we are very uh, inspired by this paper um, uh, called, uh, uh, on the, sorry, 
on the planetary boundaries by Rockstrom and all. It's a joint paper by about 19 authors in which they talk about the planetary boundaries and define them and define, first of all, where we are overshooting, we're using too much, and also where we simply don't have information enough to how we are actually performing within this. This is also the foundation for uh, Kate Rowlett's idea of uh, donut economics, in which we understand our ecological ceiling as something that is continuously, um, or our social foundation as something that is continually inter um, interfaced with my idea of an ecological ceiling, so that we need to behave, uh, we need to operate within a safe zone between uh, human needs and uh, an environmental uh, um, uh, uh, ex uh, exhaustion. So how do we how do we operate within this, and how do we rethink our practices so that they can exist within this boundary here? Uh, Kate Rowlett is clearly uh, informed also by the uh, uh, planetary boundaries. We can see that she starts developing her uh, model that the, we see the two models uh, overlaid onto each other. Um, it challenges us to move from linear to circular models of economic, uh, 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 economy but also to uh, start a discussion about, well, how do we move from the uh, uh, geosphere of um, non-renewables to a biosphere of renewable materials? So how can we as architects start considering the biosphere as the core zone uh, of materials for architecture? Um, so, uh, with this comes uh, fundamental challenges to the way that we understand our uh, space of conception. Um, the biosphere is, uh, or biomass itself, is fundamentally circular. It means that material pass through these very large systems um, and are continuously moving across into circles of, um, uh, of uh, recycling or uh, regurgitation uh, through a, st a global steady state system in which inflow exactly matches outflow. Um, uh, we have to remember that biomass is also a limited resource, it is not a resource that is, uh, uh, that is uh, extensive. We are a very large population uh, globally and when we use our biomass uh, for food, we also need to consider what happens if we start thinking of it also as building materials and how do we uh, interface these two different systems uh, uh, to each other. Um, here, the upcycling of agricultural waste into building materials is a clear uh, uh, example of how we can be uh, employing biomass uh, more intelligently. Um, uh, Needham, uh, in a text from the 1950s, uh, writes uh, uh, very beautifully about that the steady state system exists only for a couple of millennia. So the bio-based system is a thousand, two thousand years, and then it will all recycle. And this is interesting in architectural scope. If we start thinking in time, then buildings now are built for about between 30 and 80 years. Uh, if we build very monumentally, maybe we think to 100, 150 years. But we are also surrounded by buildings that are uh, millennia old. And so suddenly this idea of building a material culture that is uh, uh, fully uh, re-metabolized uh, over uh, millennia um, uh, challenges our understanding of what architecture actually is. Um, it's results in a fundamentally uh, temporalized understanding of architecture uh, and challenges the foundation of firmitas. Uh, Vitruvius, of course, places firmitas as one of the three most fundamental uh, aspects of architecture. Then uh, when we start thinking of building inside a bio-based uh, material paradigm, then this axiom of firmitas is fundamentally challenged, allowing us to think uh, in time and through uh, the endured. Um, so it uh, questions uh, how we can position 
the insurance of durability, not as a single point in time as aligned with building completion, but as a continual activity connecting design agency to processes of continual construction and maintenance. So rather than building and then somehow the architect leaving the building as the building is completed and it becomes other architects or other builders responsibility to maintain it, maybe we need to consider the built environment as something that is in a cycle of continual construction and in which we as inhabitants have a direct role in maintaining and being part of the building process. And it leads to a very different architectural ideal. So maybe I was, I'm not that old, but still, I was definitely more uh, educated into an ideal of architecture uh, um, uh, as derived from uh, Vitruvius or Palladio. Uh, but maybe here in our generation now, we need to consider maybe these kinds of architectures here that are continuously being updated, that are made out of different kinds of biomaterial that are assembled through techniques that are allow us to uh, reconstruct uh, continually. Maybe this is a, an ideal uh, uh, for contemporary architecture. So as material changes, so must our representations. And I think this is one of the, the fundamental stopping blocks for this kind of thinking uh, as it is currently. We're simply not able to represent materials through their lifespans. We understand um, uh, buildings in time through very simplistic ideas of operability or uh, through maintenance uh, um, protocols. Uh, and if we look to contemporary paradigms such as BIM, then we of course have sort of uh, different moments of temporality through uh, design for assembly, design for uh, uh, maintenance, uh, or uh, even LCAs, but also try to think about uh, building lifespans as in as they move from uh, material across design, across fabrication, and to end of life, but in very um, uh, uh, quantitative ways, where we ignore the fact that materials change their performance, or bio-based materials change their performance over time, and therefore also that the building itself is changing its nature or its its um, performance. Uh, 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 within within the time span of its uh, of its presence. So how do we build new representations that are able to understand this and new modeling techniques that allow us to consider uh, these um, metabolistic uh, or eco metabolistic uh, 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 agendas underlying agendas. Um, I think the uh, sort of here the construction of an argument for a bio-based uh, paradigm is of course sidelined or, or contextualized by a series of other competing narratives for biodesign. We see these around us um, both in the sort of circular bioeconomy is pushed very hard by the European Union. Uh, several calls out for this also at sort of very uh, uh, applied uh, level. Um, we also see systems uh, around us uh, in our daily life where we see uh, bio-based products such as plastic bags or other kinds of materials that are simply replacing existing systems. Or if we look to the design culture, we see um, the idea of designing with li uh, living systems as a new way of opening up designers' remit uh, and giving them new agencies. Um, if we were American, maybe some of you are American, I don't know, um, then we would be very aware of this guy, uh, Bruce King's uh, uh, work on uh, new carbon architecture, uh, which is also arguing for the uh, ability to store uh, um, uh, or create our, uh, buildings as uh, carbon sinks um, uh, by using bio-based materials such as timber. Um, uh, and we also, are, as I said before with LCA, we, we are developing new measures, new methods of measuring how uh, we can understand bio-based materials uh, uh, and their performance in the life cycle. 
but they don't really account for these internal changes uh, with the materials themselves, and they're challenging, uh, changing performances within the architecture that they embody within their lifespans. And this is the sort of remit that we are looking uh, at in CETA. So we, I want to show three projects that we're looking at uh, trying to understand this, and they're all probes. So they're all sort of speculative uh, uh, design probes that are really allowing us to ask questions more than answer them. Um, uh, and we have done this through this idea of the harvested, the designed, and the living. So this idea of moving through three different ways of understanding bio-based design um, and considering them as sort of nested within each other, but also as pertaining to different parameters within a bio-based uh, bio material paradigm. Um, and just a little bit before I enter all of this, I wanted to talk a little bit about some more historic projects that we've been working with, but also to frame a little bit how this fits into the idea of uh, digital crafting. So um, in our work, sorry, uh, we've worked with uh, digital crafting and material behaviors um, uh, uh, yeah, for, for the last uh, 10, 15 years. And what we've been looking at there specifically is how digital uh, fabrication allows us to work directly with materials and how working with directly with materials through the design model necessitates a formalization of their behaviors. So we all know that as we put a piece of timber on the saw, then the forces that are embedded within the material are released and the material will bend or crook or spring on the saw. And we know these behaviors as part of the craft uh, paradigms that, that, uh, that um, uh, or craft uh, traditions that are uh, uh, traditionally uh, housing these knowledges um, and that architecture through the prescriptive practices are in communication with, but it is really the remit of the craftsman to understand and to translate these uh, forces uh, into uh, the architectural um, artifact. Um, in early projects like Thicket and Thor, our idea here was to really try to understand how we can, in very, very simple ways, understand the, the material performance by bending pieces of wood, understanding their min and max bending uh, uh, capacity, and being able to design directly with these, and then um, be able to uh, construct structures that actively use these bending behaviors. Or here in Dermoid, where we're using the, the bendability of plywood, which is uh, you know completely normal sheets of 120 by 240, to create uh, from short elements to create uh, large um, uh, uh, spans. Uh, here using reciprocal truss frames, um, but with these bending active uh, uh, form, uh, or uh, units components. Um, so it leads to this idea of sort of theoretical underpinning which I believe lies under the uh, act, the sort of design computation uh, field, which is that um, that by formalizing material behaviors and allowing us to be able to uh, represent and model with these, we will be able to tease out all the uh, properties of these and thereby to steer them and control them. And this, I think, is really the fundament of, uh, of digital crafting. The idea that materials have innate uh, behaviors and that they, these can be formalized and then that they can be um, uh, manipulated or steered. Um, the question is just uh, how, sorry, just a little bit, I think. I regret putting this in, it's just here. Uh, as, and this informs a series of different projects in which we're trying to work at the small scale. So it has a sort of interscalar or multiscale remit because it means manipulating at the material level allows us to be able to understand materials at the high level or structures at the high level. And here, uh, and this is um, it's a Pia that we made in 2018, I believe, uh, and for the yeah 2018 for the Venice Biennale. Uh, 
where we worked with these knitted uh, fabrics that we were knitting ourselves. We developed our own interfaces to be able to uh, steer the, the knitting of these uh, structures. Knitting is an additive fabrication technology that allows us to knit to shape, so we don't have any waste. Um, and by controlling the stitch patterns um, at the sort of micro level, the level of the sort of millimeter scale of a uh, millimeter, we're there by able to steer the performance of these uh, membranes um, and give them uh, localized behaviors, uh, allowing them to uh, stretch in particular ways and thereby to, to design their structural uh, performance. So uh, in Isoropia, all the membranes here are in Optima. And they're all um, uh, 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 optimized for a particular form or form found for a particular form. But they're all, as they're all, each textile uh, membrane part is different, then the Optima is slightly different for each of them, allowing us to shape the form of the, of the, of the, of the whole membrane. Um, so this, this idea of material optimization or material manipulation at the low scale and, and the ability to interface this with higher scale uh, structural performance um, is one that we're transferring into this new uh, uh, bio-based material uh, paradigm, allowing us to understand how the material, sorry, uh, 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 how material performance and how material decay uh, can be composed and understood as part of an architectural paradigm. Sorry, just going through this a bit quickly. Um, so returning to the idea of the harvest of the designed and the living, um, they follow three different paradigms uh, for uh, material thinking. The first being timber, the second being biopolymers, and the third being uh, synthetic biology or uh, uh, designing with bacteria. And the reason to sort of engage in these three quite spread out probes is to think about, well, how do these, how do these different instances of a bio-based material paradigm allow us to consider both the temporality and durability and also performance of these different um, uh, 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 material systems. So timber has been, uh, we, there are evidence of uh, timber structures that are more than 10,000 years old and timber itself can last for over a thousand years. There are Japanese temples in which we have timber elements that are more than a thousand years old. So it's a practice which has a very, very long history and also has a very long duration. Biopolymers belong to the 20th century idea of designed materials. Biopolymers actually precede um, uh, oil-based uh, polymers uh, um, and are therefore also part of this idea that materials are something that we design and therefore when we design them, we also design their lifespan and their performances uh, uh, directly. And then uh, our bacteria projects belong to the context of synthetic uh, uh, biology, which is a process which has been happening over the, or a, a technology which has been developing over the last 30 years. And bacteria themselves can last three days or they can last millennia. But we also have this very sort of exploded uh, uh, time frame in which they are existing. So by these three different instances, we're trying to contextualize, but also problematize how uh, bio-based materials uh, could be understood as operating. Um, so I want to show three probes, um, all existing within the context of digital crafting. Um, here, uh, the first one is Roland. Roland uh, asks questions to the idea of uh, blue lamb structures um, and being able to uh, uh, optim or uh, heavily uh, reconsider the material stratification within a, a glue lamp beam. So at present, uh, glue lamp is uh, optimized uh, materially. We do put in an ordinary glue lamp, we put higher quality timber uh, on the outsides where we have most structural performance, and on, on the interior, put less. Uh, 
less uh, uh, high quality uh, material. Uh, what we were interested in in Roland was to consider how the beam itself could strategize material resource very uh, strategically, but also, or could strategize material, but also in respect to a better understanding of uh, material grading, a much more refined understanding of material grading. Um, it sprung out of this project coming out of the Interchain uh, Research Network uh, by Tom Spillens, who was one of the PhD students at CETA, who was working with uh, understanding how uh, material simulation and understanding of fiber direction and timber elements could uh, be interfaced with uh, uh, new strategies for uh, uh, making blue land beams, uh, uh, also by using robotic fabrication uh, for joinery and also finishing. And here, um, the bending active properties of timber were used as part of this um, ability to make strategic uh, uh, blue lamb beams. Blue lambs are, when they are uh, free from blue lambs that are bent, uh, it's incredibly important where the fiber direction is. And we can see that performance relies on a perpendicularity between the fiber direction and the, uh, um, um, uh, and the weight that is imposed on them. And there is a moment here on the side of the bell uh, curve here where we can see that the performance is going very far down and of course if we put the weight onto the fiber directions along or directly perpendicular onto them then we uh, uh, the performance is very low for the term timber beam. So in Tom's work what he was looking at was really trying to understand well what are the optimization methods if we can understand the fiber direction how can we better design or what are the the ways of designing uh, uh, glue lamp beams that take into account fiber directions uh, in uh, intricate ways. And this is also uh, directly interfaced with the question of waste that I discussed before, where um, uh, freeform glue lamp beams, as we see in Shigeru Ban's work or other uh, uh, practices, are highly wasteful. We can lose up to 50 to 70 percent of the material. This material is of course not lost as such, but it is downgraded into other material, uh, into other uh, processes such as uh, 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 paper or even energy. And of course, if we're looking at a CO2 uh, calculation, then it is much smarter to have timber inside of buildings that have longest uh, 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 lifespans and therefore can be used uh, as carbon sinks than it is in paper or energy that have very low, uh, very short uh, lifetime, uh, lifespans. So the question here was how to place, uh, how to uh, uh, limit this uh, um, uh, idea of byproduct uh, in Roland. So here uh, we received, uh, uh, we are collaborating with a company called Microtech in Italy who made these very interesting 3D scanners that can scan uh, uh, timber uh, in the interior. And then we get these images that actually tell us about where the, how the quality is varying through the material resource. So as a bio-based material, that, yeah, so we received this data set, which is both a material data set, the actual tree, and then also a, um, a, a digital data set, which is the the 3D scan or the, the CT scan. Um, yeah, so the idea in Roland is to place the quality where we need it, around the joints, on the edges of the beams, and at the ends of the beams, and to place lesser qualities where we don't need a, a high performance, which is in the middle of the beam. And these data sets allow us to understand quite precisely their CT scan, like you would do a brain scan. Um, the CT scan, they are very low resolution. The image stacks are, are pretty small. We were able to model these together to create these um, uh, complex data sets, three-dimensional data sets, uh, in which we can track uh, deviation and uh, uh, branching. So the knots uh, or the branches uh, within the wood uh, are, of course, a weakness in the wood. So is the wane, the place where we uh, see the bark uh, of the edges. And we also know the difference between high and low density uh, within the timber, which is simply the grayscale in the image here. 
So we found ways of tracking this and tracking the actual fiber direction in the timber to be able to then place that intelligently in respect to some clustering of uh, uh, algorithms that are then able to place the actual need for the timber that we have. So we have a map of what is there, we have a map of what we need, and then we use machine learning to be able to cluster these two uh, uh, maps together and get the best mapping in respect to each other and then to strategize where we put the timber. And this leads to this sort of very, um, uh, well, also graphically uh, clear uh, beam, which explains uh, sort of where the high quality is around the joint and where the low quality can be uh, placed. Um, yeah, so the point here is, of course, the bio-based material resor uh, resources are grown resources, and therefore the qualities um, and the internal structure is heterogeneous, and this heterogeneity directly uh, uh, mirrors the environmental conditions of the resource uh, through its growth. So we know uh, that the timber a tree grows and grows better and better. There's more sunny and more wet years and less in other years. Um, and this allows us to be able to understand or by developing the methods of capturing this heterogeneity and strategizing it in respect to material uh, uh, processes, we're able to um, uh, directly up, upgrade the material resource within the uh, uh, building uh, element. So in the question of the design and in the um, living um, biomaterials, we're trying to change the lifespan of these materials to reconsider really materials that have a different lifespan. So as I said before, bio-based plastics is, is, a, is an old practice. Ford made so cars in soya bean uh, plastics, um, but it was replaced by uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, polymers because uh, they're much more predictable. So the problem with bio-based uh, polymers is they have behaviors and that these behaviors are difficult to control. Um, what we really love about this is also that they're connected to a maker movement of recipe sharing. If you type a uh, bio-based polymer or how to make my own bio bioplastic into Google, you will find many, many resources of it. And this sort of democratic design uh, angle uh, of the bio um, design field, I think is very sympathetic and very much part of uh, how we are uh, working. In our project, uh, Predicting Response, we are trying to figure out how to model um, bio-based uh, polymers, which we have developed our own recipe for. They are cellulose, cellulose reinforced, uh, xanthan gum based, and um, with a varying degree of glycerol. Glycerol is what makes it sticky and therefore extrudable. So we're 3D printing uh, these materials. And the more we change the relationship between glycerol and water, um, uh, it allows us to get a more or less plastified, more or less sort of um, flexible uh, material. Um, so here we are working uh, uh, with these materials that we are able to control uh, and then we are using these um, uh, uh, graded recipes to be able to understand how we can place them uh, or how we can change the material on the flow so that we can make areas that are more flexible and areas that are more hard or dense. They're a little bit like a stiff cardboard uh, when they are resulting, but most importantly, as we are printing them, the relationship between between what we print and what it dries into being is uh, it contracts about uh, 40 40 percent. So there's a huge uh, a sort of evaporation of water that happens that means that the material sort of consolidates and solidifies. And what we are doing here is we're trying to understand how to use advanced modeling techniques such as machine learning to gather first having a proper sensing regime to gather data about how these processes are, uh, of drying are occurring and what the results uh, into complex geometries are. Um, and then to create models that can predict these performances um, and, uh, and uh, um, 
yeah, and allow us to dis, uh, create design regimes where we can design what we need to print, so the uh, digital fabrication file, to be able to get the right results, of course, so to accommodate these transformations. Um, the point of these transformations is that they are non-linear, or they are linear, but once the geometry becomes complex, then they become non-linear. Um, they are uh, very dependent on airflow, uh, so it it's very important where it has the model has access to uh, air, um, and how this air is directed across the surface. Um, so, uh, also what's interesting about biopolymers is that they can be designed with different lifespans. We are looking at porosity, the in introduction of porosity, of course, this evaporation uh, process leaves the, these small air cavities within the material and the 3D printing uh, uh, methodology allows us to steer the, um, the printing uh, or the steer the, the, the geometry of the structure. Um, and so we're interested in understanding the correlation between uh, porosity at multiple scales and lifespan. So to be able to design materials with particular lifespans that fit to the architecture that, uh, that we are designing. And finally here, the idea of the living. So we see around us uh, a, a vast um, um, uh, uh, expansion of the processes of synthetic biology where living organisms are used to design materials. Um, uh, we can see them in different kinds of uh, uh, research projects uh, from uh, biology and synthetic biology, but also in existing built uh, projects in which facades are being under understood as biofactories uh, to create uh, algae as either superfoods or fuels. Um, and here, uh, the, the idea is really to think about, well, what is an architecture that is uh, inherently living, where we're not stopping the lifespan or harvesting it, but we it re retains its lifespan. So how can we interface and coordinate the lifespans of a living architecture or a living building material and the lifespans of its inhabitants? What does that mean? And how can we uh, uh, create or uh, strategize the performances of living materials uh, as um, as a uh, uh, performances for an architecture. Here we're collaborating with uh, a lab leader, Aurélie Mossi, uh, from INSAD in Paris. We're working with these bioluminescent uh, bacteria and algae, um, looking at how to uh, 3D print uh, medium and thereby to uh, uh, just here, 3D print uh, medium to be able to create these micro architectures of uh, which have a particular lifespan. So here we are 3D printing the medium and then we inoculate it with these bacteria. These bacteria live for about three to seven days and sometimes a little bit longer, but they also propagate through the material. So we know that the bacteria live on the outside of the material and then as they die, they, they give birth to other bacteria and they sort of move through the material, uh, the material and eat the nutrition that is uh, uh, mixed into the medium. Um, so our question is, could we think of these materials as a part of an architectural structure? It's very much a placehold. Uh, the light is not very strong. Uh, it only, you can only see it uh, in, in a completely dark room. Uh, but uh, it is still very directly architectural um, in comparison to many other bacteria, then we understand light as a direct architectural uh, performance. So in this way, it allows us to build a bridge and to create a sort of fundamental uh, methodology for considering how to work with a bio-based um, living material. Um, the point of these kinds of collaborations is also that they initiate new kinds of conversations. Um, through this project, we have been working uh, with um, uh, Michael Kuy from the Marine Biologist Department at Copenhagen University. And what is so interesting about this is that 
we understand that our methodologies, the ways that we model, the ways that we can algorithmically uh, um, describe geometry and thereby generate geometry is very, very helpful also in his research where he's working with um, uh, corals and understanding the lifespan of, of, uh, of corals and coral reefs. Um, so, yeah. So, I think um, uh, the conclusion of this lecture would be that um, uh, that the bio-based uh, material paradigm necessitates a new understanding of both the technologies by which we build, but also the models by which we represent our architectural um, uh, agency. Um, and that the, what, the most fundamental thing about this is to transfer our understanding of, uh, of uh, architectural design into a temporalized one. So going from a sort of tradition of an isolated design space, which is void of time, in which the architecture is described as, as sort of pristine and completed, uh, and which coincides with, with the moment that the building is finished, um, to start expanding our understandings of what representation can be uh, so that it can grant or um, yeah it can just it can represent the building across its lifespan and thereby incorporate ideas of uh, decay or uh, erosion or consolidation or um, calcification so all these processes that are uh, changing the material over time. Thank you very much.